Hello and welcome to Ember's Reading Room. It's that moment you've all been waiting for, another exciting installment of Bedtime Tales by Linda Jennings, illustrated by Hilda Offen. I still really love the cover. The, the cover is awesome. Yeah. We would use the cover every time, but then you guys wouldn't be able to tell the videos apart. Mm -hmm. So if you want to see this cover and you come upon this particular episode, go back to the first episode in our playlist and you'll see it there. All right, so now, the peacock and the rooster. The peacock and the rooster were strutting in the farmyard. My tail is longer than yours, said the peacock. Mine has fine blue and green feathers, said the rooster, but the peacock was not impressed. Not only has mine got blue and green feathers, he said, but it has eyes, too. The farmyard was very muddy, and the peacock didn't notice that his tail was trailing on the ground. Ha! crowed the rooster. More like brown, I'd say. For the peacock's tail was covered in mud, but the rooster's short and colorful tail gleamed bright in the sun. But they don't drag their tails like that. So, yeah. I, I get the point. Like, don't be overly proud and stuff like that, but... Moving on, oh, and skipping a couple holidays, Hilda Hen's Easter eggs. Hmm. Just a few pages ago, it was Christmas. Hilda Hen was very proud of herself. She had laid four beautiful brown eggs for the Dobbins family's breakfast. Now she was watching Mark Dobbins searching for something in the garden. Hilda Hen, he called. Look what I've got. Hilda Hen looked. In Mark's basket were four brightly colored egg-shaped objects. One was red with silver spots, one was yellow with green stars, one was pink and blue, and one was orange and purple. They're your eggs, said Mark. We painted them for Easter and Dad laid a treasure hunt for us. Well, I never, said Hilda Hen. <laughs> and if you think she was like, my eggs, gosh darn it. <laughs> hmm. Mouse trouble. The mouse trouble started when Vicky bought two white mice. She kept them in a cage in the attic because her cat, Barney, loved chasing mice and catching them, if possible. The trouble was that Vicky's mice were not the only ones in the house. That night, when the family had all gone to bed, two pairs of beady eyes peered out into the dark attic from a mouse hole. Psst! Margie! There are some white mice! Out there in a cage, whispered Max Mouse. Wow. Margie immediately felt sorry for the little prisoners. We must let them out at once, she said. She ran to the cage and nibbled at the wooden catch until the mice were free. You'll have to find your own hole, Max explained. But don't go downstairs. There's a cat. Too late. The two white mice had already squeezed under the attic door and fled downstairs. Barney was sleeping on Vicky's bed when the two white mice rushed in and ran up his back. Barney leaped up and chased the mice. Terrified, they sped back into the attic and crouched in their cage until Barney was gone. It's so much nicer in the cage, they both agreed. Okay, the best part of that story was the um, wall mice. Mm -hmm. They were like, hey, hey, guys, yo, yo. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, just so many things and ways you could interpret this. Because, oh, they were set free, but they'd rather be prisoners. Ooh. Also, there are white mice out there. <laughs> Not just mice in a cage, specifically white mice in a cage. <laughs> yes, I'm <laughs> doing the whispering on purpose. Also, why did Vicky even buy white mice when she already has a cat or mice of any kind she has a cat so why buy a pet that you have to keep in the attic though with proper training cats and mice can get along just fine but they immediately went for well the mice are a problem because she has a cat she had the cat first this was a known issue going in we have such interesting comments on children's stories eh <laughs> all right page girl hmm Susan, Becky's sister, was getting married, and Becky was going to be her bridesmaid. Susan wanted her to wear a blue, frilly dress with yellow buttercups and carry a posy. But when Susan had shown Becky a picture of the bridesmaid's dress, Becky had hated it. 
She didn't like wearing dresses, especially frilly ones. Mom and Susan could see that Becky was going to be difficult. But what can we do? asked Susan. I don't want an unhappy bridesmaid. Susan's fiancé, Brian, was in the Navy, and he was going to wear his uniform. Pity there aren't any little boys in the family, he joked. Then we could have had a page boy in a sailor suit. Suddenly, Susan had an idea. The wedding day arrived at last. Susan looked beautiful in a long cream dress with a lace train. Brian looked very handsome in his naval uniform. And Becky, following behind, was the very smartest of all in her sailor suit and bell-bottom trousers. Oh, well, we have like a non-progressive story back there. This one was actually pretty good for its time because girls in uniform. Yes, and that it was okay that she didn't wear a dress. I actually had a pair of bell bottoms because they were kind of hand-me-downs. I mean, she does look quite snazzy in that outfit. Mm-hmm. The tortoise's home. Why is it that everyone has a home but me? Complained tortoise to mouse. He had just visited his friend, Rabbit, in his cozy burrow. Robin has a snug little nest in an old kettle, and Horse has a wonderful stable with a wooden door. Even Pig lives in a sty, although it is a bit on the messy side. But you have got a home, said Mouse. It's a very nice home, too. You can carry it around with you, and you don't get wet when you're caught in the rain. Of course, said Tortoise. My home is on my back. Uh, <laughs> I, I knew where this was going, but it's still like, oi. Mm-hmm. Because, yes, the tortoise has a shell. That doesn't mean that it still wouldn't like shelter and a place to hide from predators. And I think it's like the, uh, is the word brevity? Mm -hmm. Of these stories that sometimes hinders the enjoyment of them. Like, if that one was a little bit longer and the pacing on it was a little bit better, I think I would enjoy it more. All right, well, this one is a bit longer. The monster at the window. Sounds like some video games I've played. <laughs> Beth liked her new home. It had a long yard with a swing, a spooky cellar, and an attic. Above all, Beth liked her little bedroom with the sloping roof. She arranged all her glass animals on the windowsill. The first night, Beth climbed into her bed with the yellow-flowered comforter. Mom drew the yellow curtains, then turned off the light, and Beth heard her creak creaking down the stairs. Suddenly, Beth felt very lonely. Don't go, she pleaded, but Mom didn't hear. Everything was in the wrong place. The dresser was where the closet used to be, and the chair was by the window instead of behind the door. There were strange, humpy things on top of the dresser. Beth shivered. What could they be? Then Beth heard a tap-tapping at the window. It's a monster, she thought. She dived under the comforter so she couldn't hear it. Perhaps if the monster couldn't see her, it would go away. When she woke in the morning, she could see that the humpy things were the books she hadn't unpacked, and tap-tapping against the window pane was a beautiful flowering cherry tree. A cherry tree! A friend! Not a monster at all, thought Beth. It's amazing what the mind can do to you. Because the first time I read a... read? Like, I would read a, read a roller coaster. <laughs> the first time I rode a roller coaster, the worst part of it was before I got on it. After that, it was a blast. Because my mind came up with all the wonderful things that could go wrong. Well, when she arranged all her glass animals on the windowsill, I really thought the monster at the window was going to be light coming from outside. Casting shadows. On the glass animals. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. And the lumps I thought were it talking about the light. Yeah, but nope, those were books, and the tap-tapping obviously was a tree. Mm. Though, they really should trim that, because that's a hazard. Hmm, I wonder if you could send the animals a Chekhov's gun, or just a... I'm, I'm thinking more of a red herring. Yeah. The witch's dog. Apparently we're skipping holidays again. Hmm. Also a witch's dog. Mm-hmm. I want a black dog, said the little old lady firmly. The owner of Barkwell Dog's home took her along a row of cages containing dogs of all descriptions. There's this jolly little fellow, he said. But he's got a white chin, complained the little old lady. Then she saw exactly the one she was looking for. A small, neat, 
obedient, and completely black dog. That's the one I want, she cried. The little black dog trotted out of the home behind his new mistress. The owner watched them go, but he could not guess what she was saying. The first thing you will have to learn, said the little old lady, putting on her pointed hat, is how to ride on a broomstick. And off they both went, over the rooftops. That is a wonderful image. I like the idea of a dog familiar. I actually have a picture similar to this that a very dear friend drew and included in a calendar she gave me. Hmm. It was the October drawing. She had a little black dog, <laughs> but it did have some white on it. Yeah. So it was done in silhouette, but she drew herself on the broomstick and the dog riding behind. Nice. Jigsaw puzzle. Karen had been given an enormous jigsaw puzzle of a castle for her birthday. She was very excited and she could not wait to get started. But the jigsaw was very complicated. It had a moat, a keep, and a drawbridge. It took Karen three days to do. And on the third day, she found there were some pieces missing. The people standing by the moat couldn't enter the castle because there was no drawbridge. Karen searched everywhere. Finally, she found the missing pieces under the table. She clicked them into place. Mom, she cried, I'm finished. Mom came to admire the puzzle, and Karen gave a gasp of surprise. All those people by the moat, she said. They aren't there anymore. They must have crossed the drawbridge and gone into the castle. Um, okay. <laughs> I didn't expect that. That came out of nowhere. Yeah. I thought it was just her saying, oh, yeah, people won't be able to cross the bridge. I should put that in place. And then suddenly they crossed the, what is this, the Indian in the cupboard? Or the castle in the attic? <laughs> okay, that's, that's cool. It's kind of out of nowhere. Yeah, really out of nowhere. And just imagine what this could have been like if this story was newer. Now that we have 3D puzzles of castles. Ooh. Stacy's christening. Darren's baby sister, Stacy, was going to be christened. His big cousin, Joan, was one of the godmothers. He liked Joan. She was his godmother as well and gave him terrific presents. But he was fed up about the christening. Everyone was cooing and awing over Stacy and saying all sorts of mushy things about her. She had even been given presents, presents that Darren knew she was too young to enjoy. He felt very left out. Then Mom told him to dress in his gray flannel suit. He hated his suit and pulled the tie around so that it didn't look so dumb. He stomped off down the road to the church between Gran and Grandad. The little lamb, cooed Great Aunt Ethel, peering at Stacy. Isn't she good? At this, Stacy opened her mouth and roared and roared. Darren put his hands to his ears. Stupid great aunt Ethel, he thought. She's really set her off. When they had reached the font, Stacy was still roaring. The viker couldn't hear himself speak. Can't anyone stop that baby crying? asked Grandad. Darren stepped forward. I can, he said, and he tickled Stacy's chin and made his ugly monster face. Stacy stopped crying and started to chuckle instead. The little lamb, cooed great aunt Ethel again. But Gran smiled at Darren. Thank you, she said. Interesting, just kind of didn't like it. And then turned around to, he saved the day. Nice picture, he's holding his ears going, oh God. Mm -hmm. See the little baby in the background crying? Yep, and you see how the tie has been messed with. You can see why he said it would look stupid, because he, look how uneven it is. No, he said... He pulled it so it wouldn't look so stupid. Yeah. Pulled the tie around. I'm not quite sure what that means. Not quite, but here it looks a bit messy. All right. Top Chef. Hmm. Nothing in common with the show. The book came first. Mom asked Gary to help her do some cooking. Oh, oh, no, no, okay, no. <laughs> what? Cooking, stupid, said Gary. Cooking's for girls. Ah, well, remember the times. Some of the best cooks are men, said Mom. I want you to help me make some special cookies. 
Mom sifted flour and added some sugar and ginger. Mix butter into the mixture, stir in some molasses, and make a sticky ball, she told Gary. Then Mom rolled it flat and cut it into shapes. Wow, said Gary. They are special cookies. Between them, Mom and Gary cut out 12 shapes and baked them in the oven. And out came 12 gingerbread boys. I think I'll be a chef when I grow up, said Gary, as he ate his third gingerbread man, because I did like making these special cookies. Yeah, it's supposed to be one of those stories where there's something you don't like. Oh, I like it. Yeah, sorry, cooking's for girls. Yeah, this was a real problem for, I think it's, is it, no, Hasbro owns it now. Um, the little, the Easy Bed Coven? Mm-hmm. For the longest time, we, like, couldn't figure out that you needed to make one that wasn't so pink. Yeah. Also, most chefs still seem to be men. So apparently, cooking is for girls, but being a chef is for boys. All of it's stupid. Moving on. Yep. Everything's equal. Rainbow Playground. One night, a big storm completely destroyed the goblins' playground. When Grendel, Griselda, and Gareth went out to play the next morning, they found their merry-go-round had been smashed to pieces and their swings blown away. What shall we do? wailed Gareth. It will take months to build another one. Just then, the sun came out, and with it, the most beautiful rainbow. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? said Griselda. Yippee! said the three goblins. They clambered up the rainbow and slid all the way down to the other side. I think I've stated this before in the same book, but those do not look like goblins. No, no, they they don't. Also, this is the second time... I think the other story with goblins in it also got a full-page image. Yep. Oh, same goblins, I think. Only one. Oh. Griselda and Jerry. Hmm for the balloon race. This has been another thrilling installment of Bedtime Tales by Linda Jennings, illustrated by Hilda Offen. Or AKA Random Stories. That I think most of our English teachers would have flunked, unfortunately. Yeah, still enjoyable though. Well, we're still reading the book, you're still watching the videos. Something was done right. Yeah. Want a copy for yourself? If we can find it, there should be an Amazon link. It's probably the same link from like the last couple of videos. Unless somebody bought that one and it was used, then we'll have to find you a new link. Also, Ebates, because I can. Amazon and Ebates are not affiliated with sponsors of, etc., etc., for Ember's Reading Room or any content of the Lux Analysis channel. Yeah, they, they don't care about us. Thanks again for listening. <laughs>